Hi, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass, <coughs> excuse me. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do uh, record the show every week and it is then posted in our archives for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think that might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. For those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries here in Nebraska, similar to the state library in other states. So we, we provide services and, um, to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find things on our show for, that will be for all types of libraries, public, academic, K-12, museums, uh, corrections, special libraries, anything and everything you could find something um, on, our, uh, on our show. And we do a mixture of things here on the show, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, um, the demos of services and products we think that um, may be interesting to libraries. We sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff come on and do show presentations about things that we're doing here in Nebraska locally or here through the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, but we also bring in guest speakers from around the, um, the state and around the country to talk about cool things they're doing in their libraries. Um, and that's what we have with us this morning. Uh, before we do get into today's show, I just want to make a brief little introduction, um, talk a little bit briefly here for our Nebraska libraries. Uh, we um, here at the Nebraska La Library Commission have been monitoring the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that's going on right now, and we do have some special resources on our website for our Nebraska libraries. If you're in another state, check your state library or your state library association. They may have some of the same resources available to you. We have a list here that is updated as we hear from libraries or we find out what's going on with libraries, if they're open, closed, what special situations they have going on um, in their libraries. And we have a specific blog post here pinned to the top of our website um, about um, pandemic resources. And if you go to the specific um, page here, we have, if you're a business, um, what, are you doing with, what can you do with your kids, unemployment. But for libraries, we have a subpage here, a lot of the different kinds of things you might be dealing with as a library. Were you closed? Are you reopening? What are you doing about summer reading? Um, there's some videos or webinars recording things available on here. Um, we're always adding to it as we hear about new things and uh, that are available from us, from our state government, from the CDC, uh, World Health Organization, whoever, we try and keep things up to, here, up to date on here. Um, also for here in Nebraska, <clears throat> you may have seen here, we do have just opened up on Friday, our CARES Act grant is now open and available. We did receive funding from IMLS, <coughs> excuse me, as at other states. So if you are a Nebraska library, go ahead and apply for our CARES Act funding. If you are from another library or another state, uh, as I said, check your state and see if they do have anything similar. So on today's show, I'm going to go to our, <clears throat> this is our Encompass Live page. I am going to, Christy, I'm going to hand over presenter control to you and then um, right now so we can get your slides up and then we can get into your presentation. So you should see that pop up. Okay, one second. Yep. We're not seeing it yet. Did you see the pop up for handing over presenter control? I did not. Um, Krista, can no. you drive? Hang on a sec, let me switch here and then I'm going to try again here. All right. Hand it over again. Do you see it yet? There we yep. go. Now you can stop. Yep. All right. There we Good. go. All right, so this morning with us, uh, we're going to be talking about automating virtual student library cards. And many libraries have 
um, wanted to do this. And especially now we have COVID-19 and um, it may be um, useful to you know we're trying to at least get virtual or um, you know online only library cards out to people. So this can be some good resources here. Um, this is a school and a county library got together to do this uh, jointly in, um, so they are going to talk about uh, how they pulled it off, I guess, is, the, is, the, is what we're going to do. <laughs> um, and I'll just hand it over to you guys to um, introduce yourself and um, tell us all about what you did there. All right. So as Kristen mentioned, my name is Christy Rieger, and I am the technology manager for Scott County Libraries, which is located in Scott County, Minnesota. We are just a little bit south of the Twin Cities. Um, Shakopee is the biggest town that is located in Scott County. Um, I'm joined today by Sandy Reiches, who is the 6th through 12th Media Specialist for Shakopee Public Schools, and by Nathaniel Strauss, who is the IT Manager for Shakopee Public Schools. If you have any questions for us after the presentation, our contact information is located on this slide, uh, so feel free to reach out to us after. And I also would like to mention that today we're going to be talking about some techie stuff. So some technical notes that might be helpful for you to know as we're going through the presentation today is that Shakopee Public Schools uses Infinite Campus for their student information system, which we then was able to build a connection to into our Cersei Dynex Symphony workflow system. We are a SaaS hosted software as a service hosted library, so that may be helpful information for you to know. And without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Sandy to talk about why virtual student library cards. Good morning. So our biggest goal with this partnership was to create more equitable access for students to the public library resources. So students have always been able to sign up for a library card by going into a public library branch, but we wanted to eliminate that step because we felt like it could be a barrier for many of our students. And with the partnership in place where all students have a virtual library card, it means that as a media specialist who works with classes on research instruction and literacy promotion, that I can promote those public library resources to classes and students, knowing that they all have access. Another goal for the partnership was to give students more choice in the books they read. We know how important choice is for helping students become strong readers, especially those who may struggle with it a little bit. And as media specialists, we're proud of our print and our digital collections within our schools, but we were thrilled about our students also being able to access cloud library and the print collections of the public library in a way that was really convenient for students. And as we dug into all the digital resources that the public library offered that as a school district, we could probably never afford, we came to realize that books were really the tip of the iceberg. So we first explored the idea of having a library card number printed on the student's ID cards, but it didn't seem cost efficient or practical. So we quickly changed course to a virtual card with a format that incorporates the student ID number and is really easy for students to remember. And then with our district being a one-to-one -one environment, we really felt like the partnership could help to create a bridge between home, school, and public library. I'll turn it over to Christy. All right. So like Sandy mentioned, um, the school district approached us and we put together a partnership planning team. So you'll see on the screen here that I've listed some roles in some folks who've had a role in the partnership. So at the school district level, your superintendent and school administrators, um, conversations were had at the top level to make sure that um, leadership was aware of the program and what its goals were. Um, and also to help communicate it with the school board and other uh, stakeholders to make sure that um, everybody was on board and making sure that we have the ability to transfer data back and forth. Um, the media specialists who, um, shout out to Sandy and all of the other media specialists in the district, they are really the, the real champions of this project. 
Um, and also to Nathaniel, who I'm going to talk about, who will talk today about the role that the IT department played um, to help automate the process. Um, and then over at the library here, so obviously our library director was involved, um, our technology and technical services department, which I oversee, um, had a big role to play, our learning outreach manager, and also our branch library staff. So really, you're probably thinking to yourself, that's a lot of people. Um, but I'd like to emphasize that it does take a lot of people to work together as a team to make sure that this is a, is a successful project um, right off the ground. So in preparing for the partnerships, uh, we did a couple important steps that if you are considering uh, making this kind of partnership with your school libraries and your public library systems, that might be helpful for you to think about. The first thing that I think is really important for everybody to think about is to establish a student data agreement. So what is that? What that is is an agreement between the public library and the school district to who transfer children's personal information. We all need to be uh, good stewards of children's private information. Obviously, we are not passing along um, specific pieces of identification um, that the school holds on to. It's more about things that you just need to create a library card. Um, but keeping that front and center is really important, I think. Um, the next thing that we did is we defined the partnership with a memorandum of understanding. So what did we do there? We decided to think about which grades would be included in this. We started out with just our high school students, but maybe some folks wanna start right away with K-12. Um, some parents may have some thoughts about Having their, child's their, having their child being able to access the full gamut of all of our eBooks. Those are some things that you wanna think about. Also, what is the long-term relationship? What resources and time are each department going to commit? Um, I think one of the learnings that Nathaniel and I can speak to is that both of our IT departments had to work together to make sure one, that the transfer of data is, is smooth and continues to be smooth, and also just to be able to continue to work together to solve technology problems. And both parties need to commit to doing that. So those are some things that you can include in that memorandum of understanding. The next thing that we did is we designed a pilot. So as I mentioned earlier, we started out with just our high schoolers, and the reason why we did that is because we wanted to start with a, a group where the if something went wrong, that the impact on instruction would be a little bit less minimal. We started in May of 2019, last year. Um, we also designed an opt-out process for families to be able to say, I don't want to be involved in this, so please don't share my child's data. Um, pleased to say that that's actually less of a concern, but um, we'll talk more about that later. Um, and also just for the two technology departments to be able to figure out what kind of ongoing techno technical support is needed at both the school and the library systems level. So I'm gonna pass it over to Nathaniel to talk about what, how we started out getting our accounts made and also what the opt-out process looked like. Yeah, thanks. So um, I'm Nathaniel Strauss. I'm the IT manager at Shively Public Schools. So um, one of the reasons that we decided to go with opt-out versus opt-in is that we already had a policy in place for marketing releases. And so your school district might have something similar is that um, in most states, the way it works is that when you register your kid in a school, um, you have the option to basically opt them out of the school using them for marketing material. You know, if you think about like those um, those marketing materials or community ed brochures or um, pictures on the, on the school website, those are all things that we use to market the school district. And as a family, uh, they have the option to opt out of using their children for, for those situations. And so we basically just use the same policy um, in terms of the library card opt out saying that if you didn't want us to transfer your data to a third party organization, in this case, the Scott County Library, we were not gonna do that. Um, so we collected that information in uh, one of two ways. So um, right now, uh, really the only way is sort of for uh, parents to fill out a form or a uh, paper copy. So paper copies were sent home to parents. And then also um, there's a Google form that uh, parents could fill out to opt out 
And what we've added is there during online registration, when a family first enters the district, there's a, a checkbox that they can check to opt out as well. Um, interestingly enough, what we found is that um, when everybody went to distance learning um, due to coronavirus, a lot of families realized that they wanted this service. They didn't actually want to opt out and they changed their mind or they opted back in um, to make sure those, those resources were available to their kids. So it was kind of interesting to see that shift. Um, of course, data privacy is always important with schools. Um, we need to get better at that in general when we're dealing with student data. Um, and you know, we're now rolling this out to K through 12, which means that there are a lot of students under 13 involved as well. So um, at every point during this process, you need to make sure that data is being transferred securely and that um, you know, we keep in mind the, the safety and the privacy of our kids. So um, as an IT department, we basically just get a report of who opted out um, every few days, every week, and we would just manually do that in our information system. We would opt them out, and they just wouldn't be part of the report. Um, I think Sandy and the other media specialists really had a big part to play in making sure people are, are aware of the opt-outs. Um, in terms of communicating, messaging, and marketing this whole program, it was really on them to get the word out to families and to students as to how this is all going to work. And so opt-outs were a big part of that. We, we didn't end up getting too many um, simply because people want access to these resources. But again, um, it's important that we listen to the wishes of the families who don't want their data transferred. And so we just, we just made sure that, that was a priority for us. Um, and the only other thing that um, maybe is not my specialty, but um, when students do opt out, you know, teachers are using these resources as curriculum in their classrooms. And so if a, if a family does choose to opt out, that's that's their right. And so teachers just need to make sure that um, they're able to identify those kids and know who those kids are. And then the day that they use those resources, they have an alternative activity they can use in the classroom. Christy, can you go to the next slide? So is this one you or of this me? I think this is me here. All right, so go one for it. First steps was to determine what students would have access to with the account. And we decided that the virtual student library card would allow students to access all of the digital resources. And then they could also check out up to two physical items at a time with no overdue fees. And like Christy mentioned, one thing that we're really transparent about in our communication with parents is that this account does allow students full access to the Scott County Library collection because we're not able to filter the content for age appropriateness. Um, but we really haven't had any issues come up with that. Yeah, so when we were creating the accounts, um, Sandy and I talked through what again what students we wanted to have what we wanted the students to have access to but also how we were going to create those accounts in our ILS um, I worked with our tech services department um, to design what that looked like in our ILS um, I have a background in schools and one of the things that I remember from my experiences as a library media specialist is that logins can be very painful when you're working with students. Um, so obviously Sandy and I talked it through and we decided first that a shorter login number would be better for kids. So our ILS, our regular library cards, we have a 14 digit library cards. Um, so we decided to shorten the number of digits. We also decided that it was still important for us to use a pin number to help us continue to protect the child's um, privacy and also just to continue to help students learn um, good privacy protection practices. Um, another thing that we did, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, is we did a lot of testing uh, with different databases and also with Cloud Library, which is our ebook platform and uh, RB Digital. Um, we had to figure out how a lot of our databases authenticate. Um, with the cards and also working to figure out where barriers might be encountered and try and remove them for the students wherever we could. So you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, so how do you create that many accounts? You said kindergarten through 12th grade, right? 
The answer is yes. So that was about 8,000 or so accounts that we needed to figure out how to make. Um, so the first thing we thought of is, oh, we could physically make them one by one at the branch level. Uh, probably not. Uh, so we decided to automate this process. So the first thing that uh, our our tech services team worked on was to figure out how to mass create accounts in our ILS. So as I mentioned, we are a Cersei Dynix library. We use Symfony workflows. Um, there is a special report called the load user report that allows you to mass upload accounts. Um, the other thing that we that Nathaniel and I had to figure out was how to get that information between the school's IT department and us. Um, so, and part of that is also just figuring out how to transform that data to make sure it can smoothly land in our ILS. So I'm actually going to pass it over to Nathaniel to talk a little bit about what that process looks like because it starts with the school. Yeah, so this was probably our biggest challenge. And actually along the way, there are a few false starts to this project only because we couldn't really figure out how to get the data out of our student information system and transfer it over to the library system to create these accounts. Um, and the reason for that is because, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of foreign to the library world. I'm really, uh, most of my experience is in the school side of things. And so, you know, even the word ILS and definitely Cersei Dynix were totally new to me. And so when I looked at the way that Cersei Dynix processes data, um, it was it was kind of weird, <laughs> honestly. Um, it was not something that I was used to. It wasn't like a regular database or a CSV or tab separated. It was just its own thing. And so um, I wasn't used to that. And they did have an API, which we could integrate with or we could interact with to get the data over. Um, but Cersei Dynix is a policy where to use their API, you need to go through their training courses. <clears throat> so that would have been a couple thousand dollars we didn't really have, you know, coming from a school background. When we look at doing a project like this, we try to do it on the cheap, you know, like we're looking for the best bargain possible. So that wasn't going to work. Um, the only other option that we found is that they do have what they're calling an ASCII formatted data um, format, and that's what we ended up using. So um, the big challenge here was trying to figure out how to take the data that we had already, convert it into a data format that Cersei Dynix understood, and then load the users from there. So Christy, can you go out to the next slide? All right, so here's a CSV example. You know, this is just a spreadsheet, nothing fancy. Um, but this is the sort of data that we can pull from our student information system. You know, things like student ID, first name, last name, grade, all those um, things that we need to actually create a library card in the Scott County Library System. Um, what's important to note here is that the opt-outs are done at this point in time. So we're not opting out with some sort of logic in our code later on. We're actually using the report from our student information system, in this case, Infinite Campus, to not pull uh, that student record at any point in time if they're uh, marked as opted out. All right, next slide. And this is what the Cersei Dynamics format looks like. So this is what they call their flat ASCII LD user format. Uh, and again, uh, this is something that was brand new to me. It's, it's honestly really weird. Um, because we don't have API access, we had to fall back to something that is kind of old school, um, as far as I could tell. Maybe people in the library world are more used to this, and I just had never seen it before. Um, but each new record is um, demarcated by this document boundary line. So if you look at the very line one, it's the three asterisks with document boundary. So that's what one record is. And then everything after that is pipe delimited. And so you have these, again, it's just very bizarre to me. I have these fields where uh, it starts with a period, then the field name, so the first one would be user ID, another period, a tab, a pipe, the letter A, and that's where your data starts for that account. And so um, there's a source down there. If you want to look at the presentation later, this is all documented by Cersei Dynex. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, people who are more used to um, library databases and how library data is formatted, this would be more familiar. But to me, it was, it was really brand new. And so, um, my solution to that was to write some code to transfer our CSV data to this format. So can you go to the next slide? All right, so what I did is that um, I have some Python background, so I have a little bit of code um, ability. And so what I did is I wrote a script in Python to convert CSV data, which is um, being reported directly from our SIS 
to the Cersei Dynex flat ASCII format. And so the project is totally available out there. Um, I forget what I license it as, but it is basically free for everybody to use. I'm not saying that it is going to be perfect for your exact situation, especially if you're not using Cersei Dynex, um, but it is a good template to get you started as to how you can convert this data if you need to. Um, you're welcome to, I'm not going to go through it now, but you can go to that link and it kind of walks through the entire process of how to get set up and how to get started. Um, but yeah, this is this was our solution basically is instead of uh, you know manually typing in or manually creating all these accounts, what we do is we have the script convert the data for us and then we pass it over to Scott County Library. So I think there is a example of that in the next slide. Yeah, so here's kind of an overview of how this process works. So every morning at 3 a.m., our SIS will automatically generate a report with all the students that are um, eligible for library card, excluding the opt-outs. That data is then passed to an FTP server that we host. Um, we then have a scheduled task and, you know, people who are familiar with Windows servers or maybe a Linux server with a cron job, it's really, really basic. We're not doing anything fancy. Um, every morning at 3.30 a.m., we're then taking the data that our SIS put in our FTP server. We're running the script against it and converting it. And then we are using that script to upload to Scott County's Cersei Dynex folder or their, um, their SSDP uh, server. And then after that, Cersei Dynex will on a schedule run that load user report that Chrissy talked about earlier. So that was a really quick run through, but the overview is that we export our data, we convert our data, we send our data out to Scott County Library, and then they use their load user report to create accounts as needed. Awesome. Um, Thanks, Mateo. Yeah. Yep, you're welcome. All right. So the next the next thing that we did in the process after figuring out how were how were we going to transfer and transform all of the data on a regular basis over between the school systems and the library system was to do some testing. So the first test that Nathaniel and I ran was to test of uploading a fake student into the ILS. Um, if you want some more details about how we did that, um, you can talk to us about that um, on the side. Um, the next thing that we did with that test student was to start logging into things both at the school and at home. Um, we wanted to check that our library databases um, and other online resources wouldn't be caught um, against internet filtering, which can be a barrier in the classroom for the teachers. Um, so it's really important to do that with a real student device. Uh, so we actually went on site into the school, grabbed a student iPad and a student MacBook and did some practice logins into different databases. Um, and then we also went and tried this at home with a student device. Um, to make sure that we wouldn't be experiencing anything different with the filters. Um, and as I mentioned before, we did a lot of test logging into the databases in the catalog. Um, so Sandy created a checklist of resources that we knew that would be really important and interesting for the school library media specialist to deploy in the classroom. So that helped us pick out some priorities with testing. Um, and then we were able to go one by one and make sure that each one in the testing process was good to go and then obviously doing that with our ebook platforms and i can't emphasize enough how important testing is in this process um, it is really unfortunate to get really excited about a project like this and then deploy it with a group of kids and then hear that it doesn't work i can't log in um, which can be really frustrating for the teacher. It can be really frustrating for the students. Um, it can kind of help lose momentum on the project. So definitely, definitely make sure that you do some testing. I just want to add there really quick. Um, in general, uh, schools are required to filter. So E-rate funding is tied to the internet connection being filtered for students in particular. And so what I noticed in the library world is that there are a lot of proxies already being used either to proxy the connection for the database or to proxy the connection for um, authentication for SIP. Um, there's a lot of proxies being used all over the place. And so it's really common that proxies don't like to work together. They often fight each other. Um, but almost every filter that a student device has will also be a proxy in some form or fashion. And so it, it is really important to make sure you test those things. The school district can probably help you. Um, you know, they can uh 
probably whitelist some things to make sure that your proxies get precedent, that um, we're not double proxying that traffic. But it, it is really important um, coming from a, a school background, uh, you know, libraries work in a lot of similar ways, um, but it's, it's kind of, um, I'll, I'll just tell you that most school IT staff will not be very familiar with how libraries work, even though it might become a practice in the library world. So um, just having somebody explain to school staff, oh yeah, actually we, we proxy this connection because we need the database to look like it's coming from this place um, is an important thing to explain to the school IT staff. Yes, it is very important for both the library's technical services staff and for the school IT staff to be working together on a project like this. And so I think that's something I want to add to as well. Um, so I know Christy had said that the media specialists were the champions of this project, but the partnership really wouldn't have happened without the collaboration and the technical expertise of Christy and Nathaniel and those two IT departments. So I would again echo that, that collaboration is so key. So once we had the technical pieces in place and we knew that the partnership was a possibility from a logistical standpoint, we needed to get approval and buy-in from the school system. So our Scott County Library Director met with the superintendent and then our district's IT director and I presented to our school board for approval. Then we also presented to building principals for feedback. And for all of the groups, after we covered the resources that students would have access to, they were so excited about the partnership. It was, it was really fun to see. We also presented to the public library staff and the media assistants in the schools because these are the folks that have the most direct contact with students on a daily basis. So we really wanted to make sure that they were familiar with how it worked. So to prepare for a rollout, we worked with a superintendent to draft an informational letter for families. And we also worked with our district translators to get translations of the letter in the most commonly spoken languages in our district. Christy updated the Scott County Library website. I updated the school websites just to make sure we had the information on the partnership in um, a specific location. Nathaniel, he made the apps for the resources that we thought the students would use the most available in self-service, like Scott County Library app, Cloud Library, Homework Help. And then the learning and outreach manager from the public library and our media specialists presented at building staff meetings to let the teachers know about the partnership and what kind of resources the students would have access to. Kind of a train the trainer model. And then Christy, if you'll go to the next slide, please. So in Shakopee, we did a staggered rollout and our soft launch happened last May for the ninth through 11th graders. And then our official launch happened near the beginning of the school year with all the sixth through 12th graders. Things seemed like they went really smoothly. Uh, Christine, Nathaniel, and I continued to check in throughout the fall just about how implementation was going. Uh, like Nathaniel said, we monitored for those opt-outs. And then we planned with our elementary district media specialist to figure out a plan for the elementary rollout for last December. Okay, Christy, thank you. So our next part of the implementation was promotion. So our promotion to families included that informational letter from the superintendent. We sent that out through mail at the elementary level and then 612 through the student management system. We also provided information at open house, parent-teacher conferences, and then through other district communication channels like social media and newsletters. And then for students, we sent out a two minute promotional, um, promotional video that was shown in an advisory that just sort of highlighted the resources that we thought students would be the most interested in and basically just how to use that new virtual card. And then I also did in-person presentations for classes like freshman seminar, AVID, EL classes, and then for any class that I was working with for research instruction or literacy promotion, 
I threw in information about the virtual student library card. And then after those initial building staff meetings, then throughout the year, I met with smaller groups of teachers like PLCs or departments uh, or specialized groups like counselors or equity specialists to talk to them um, in a smaller setting about the kinds of resources their students might be most interested in. All right, Christy, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. So one thing I've noticed as we rolled out the partnership is that the instruction on the resources that students have access to through the virtual student library card, it just fits so naturally into what I'm already doing, you know, whether it's instruction on how to use a database or book talks. And at the beginning of the partnership, I used to keep this spreadsheet recording each time we promoted the partnership to a group of students or teachers. And around winter break, I stopped keeping track. Uh, we had reached about 200 groups. And I realized like it's just become such a natural part of my interaction with students and teachers. And so it's really become a seamless part of our, our media instruction. And then one result of the partnership that we've, is that we've been able to repurpose some of our spending. So for example, we used to purchase the Facts on File Issues and Controversies database for all three of our secondary schools. A lot of teachers use that for argumentative writing. But because the public library already offers this database, we decided to give up the subscription. And with the money that we saved, I purchased SpringShare LibGuides for the secondary schools. And it's been this amazing tool for creating research and reading guides that synthesize the resources from our school collections and the resources from the public library. So Christy, if you could navigate to that example. Oops. So an example of, of this is a LibGuide I made for a middle school reading strategies teacher during distance learning this spring. So for her students who struggle with reading, she was looking for ebook and audiobook pairings. And Christy, if you could navigate to the realistic fiction and humor tab at the top. And our school digital collection has a good number of these, but it really wasn't anywhere near enough to support all six of her classes. So because of the partnership, I was able to put together a libguide that showed these pairings from both Mac and Via, our school's digital platform, and Cloud Library from the public library. And I, as I made the guide, I was just amazed how much Cloud Library offered our students. And then because the students in her classes are middle schoolers, they have school-issued iPads, which are great as e-readers. She does have some students who really prefer print books. So Christy, if you could navigate to the last tab there. I added a tab with information that Christy sent me on how to do curbside pickup from the public library during the time we're in now where students can't go inside a school or public library to check out, check out books. So, you know, overall throughout the year, this partnership has been so valuable to us, but it's been particularly valuable during distance learning. I'll turn it over to Christy. All right. So the next thing that we did was to create an opportunity for the teachers to get library cards. Obviously, um, Sandy and the other media specialists are the champions of this project. Um, and they're using it in their instruction, but we also wanted to empower teachers to be able to use these resources independently. Um, so we at the, the, the public library level have something called the Educator Access Cards. It's actually a digital uh, resources only card. If the teacher is a Scott County resident, we just make them a regular card. Um, it's a nice courtesy service that allows the staff to access online resources that their students have access to. Um, so they're not left out in the process. Um, our learning and outreach manager and Sandy visited 
um, teachers, PLCs, and staff meetings and other opportunities to talk to them about this. And to, basically, we created a form um, that allowed the teachers to sign up. We did not automate this part because I believe that there is a law about your employer sharing um, personal data. So we, it was more of an opt-in uh, process, but I'm really pleased to say that we actually, for an entire school district, were able to create about 160 or more new educator access accounts for the teachers. Um, so it's really exciting to see that um, it's not just living with one one teacher or a set of teachers, but rather that this is going to become a part of instruction overall. So Sandy's going to talk a little bit more about what that's looked like on the ground at the school. So overall, because of the partnership, students have had greater choice in what they're able to access, both for school and for personal growth. And this year, throughout the year, we've noticed that a large number of students are using their virtual student library cards, which has been wonderful to see. And the resources that they seem to be using the most are Cloud Library for eBooks and audiobooks and Homework Help Now. H Homework Help Now is a service through the public library that provides online one-on-one -on -one tutoring in all grades and subjects with certified tutors in English and Spanish seven days a week from 1 p.m. to 11 p.m. So students are able to get help with homework outside of the school hours. And I, even before distance learning, I noticed teachers really promoting this with students and taking advantage of this service. And I can imagine during distance learning, it's um, been even more handy. So it's really fun to see students and teachers excited about the partnership and actively using it. Yeah. So some important takeaways that we wanted to share if you are considering this kind of partnership um, to help you be successful is first, um, you're probably thinking, wow, that's a lot of technical stuff that they talked about. Um, that is for sure. So the first thing to know is, is that your school district IT department will certainly have a large role to play. Um, I could not have done this project without Nathaniel and his team helping out, doing testing, uh, making sure that the project was um, very smooth, making sure that we could access what we needed to access um, and remove any technical barriers for children and for teachers. Um, as I re reiterated before, test, test, test. Make a list of all of the resources that you want to use and be very intentional about making sure that you walk through the process from the point of view of a student. Um, Another thing that I wanted to share from the point of view of technical services is that we wanted that there were some blind spots for us about authentication. Um, we needed to make sure that again the students would not encounter any barriers. So knowing what the student is going to experience when they're trying to log in is really important. Um, also, continually marketing the partnership. I think it's really easy to get excited and then sort of watch this sort of fade into the background or um, perhaps not be as excited. Um, so we continually market the partnership internally and externally. I say internally from the public library's perspective, um, like Sandy mentioned earlier, we made sure that our branch library staff was really aware of this project. So that way they could help us encourage at the branch that if a, if a child comes in and wishes to use a library resource or is not sure whether or not they can take something home with them, um, that they can help us continue to say, hey, oh, you go, you're you in Chakopee, right? You can use your student library card and just help us continue to verbalize that to families and to children to make sure that um, they know that this resource is there. And then um, finally, to make sure that the school district's IT department and the library's te technology and technical services department are continually communicating. Um, I think that there have been times, for example, when Cloud Library is having an issue and it's important for me to communicate that to Sandy to make sure that 
per lessons don't have an issue or that a specific database is down or something like that, or to identify, hey, when a student clicks this link, they're not really getting to where they need to go. Can you fix that? And just knowing that, that we have a commitment to each other to make sure that this continually benefits children. Um, so this is a really, a really wonderful, uh, robust partnership. Um, so with all of that, all of that information, we want to know, do you have any questions for us? Yeah, all right. Um, yes, people, if, if there are a couple of questions come in. Um, if anybody does have any questions, go ahead and type them into your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right. Um, someone has a good question. I don't think you mentioned this. Um, if a student already has a physical card, but the card was blocked or expired, were these students able to apply for a digital card as well? Or does that blocking and expiration come through when you had that, you're transferring the information about the students and their accounts? I can speak to that. Um, these digital library cards are completely separate. So we recognized early on from the technical services standpoint that there would be some duplication in the system, that there may be a child who has a regular library card, it might be blocked, it may be in some specific status. And we decided we were fine with that. It's okay. What's most important about the virtual student library card is that the student is able to, to access things at school. Um, so no, those statuses do not come through. Those are totally separate um, from these cards. And one thing I can speak to from the school standpoint is when I went into classes, usually at the you know the beginning, I just do a show of hands of how many people are active users of the maybe the standard card that they had applied for um, at a younger age, and it was usually only a handful of students in each class, which mm -hmm. really illustrated. Yeah. How many students the partnership was reaching? Mm -hmm. It'd be yeah. You think oh they it's gonna be everyone and we'll be good and it's not always yeah. Uh, okay, and another question here uh, it says you said that you choose the library card number <clears throat> that is assigned to students. How did you communicate that card number and pin to the students? So their library card number is the district's number. So it's set where it's independent school district 720 in Minnesota. So 720 and then the student six digit library card number or not library card number, their student ID number. So it's a nine digit number, not a 14 digit like our normal one. And then their pin number is the last four digits of their actual library card number. So I'm actually going to exit out of this one. This is just all information numbers that the kids would already know. You just have to let them know, look at these particular numbers to figure out what yours is. Yes. And Sandy made okay. these really awesome graphics nice. that we've been trying to put on all of the different marketing pieces to help students continually remember what the what the number is because again these are these are kids we know that logins are something that they continually practice so um, and also it can be a barrier so we decided to try and make it as easy as possible for them something they already have yeah and yeah. from a teacher standpoint yeah. I know especially at the younger grades this can be an issue but they're already using that student ID number every day for lunch and for book checkout from their school learning commons so. It was really nice to be able to incorporate their student ID number that they're already very familiar with. Right, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this goes along with it, as far as communicating it to them. This is what you're just talking about there at the end. That communication is key between all parties involved: the, the school, the library, uh, the public library, um, the teachers. Um, I'm sure all helping to get this information to the students so they know how to use it. Yes, definitely. Uh, and someone says, thanks, that helps a lot. Good. Um, oh, and someone has a question. Does the student have the option to change the PIN number if desired? Or is that a locked in? It is. So the, the answer is yes, they could. Yeah. But um, 
every day when the report that Nathaniel mentions runs, part of his script is to re re upload the pin number. Um, uh, so okay. it will just get and then default back to the, yeah. the original any no matter what they try to do. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that makes sense if there's anyone who's like, I don't remember my even the younger kids, it's an it's better than saying, Well, what did you change it to? It's it's gonna always be, yeah. That's exactly right. It, it is kind of a, a, a quirk of Cersei Dynex, but we mm -hmm. kind of realized, oh, that's maybe not so bad after all. Yeah, it solves some of the uh, very common things that librarians deal with with many of their patrons that come into the public libraries of not knowing what their logins are. Um, so there's a place where they could do this. It, I mean, I'm hopefully it's, uh, I'm hoping it's not like right in their face. Like in many places it says, you know, click here to change your password right in your, right out the bat, yeah. Yes, and I think that we've done a pretty good job of communicating to the students that they don't, don't. need to change their PIN. Sure. Um, it's difficult from my standpoint to turn off or hide the reset PIN because it's yeah. a major function, as you mentioned, for the rest of our <laughs> the rest of our patrons. Yeah, and if you're constantly promoting and giving it like this kind of documentation saying this is what it is, they're going to have to know, well, if you've changed it, it's, it's going to go back. So yeah. Don't mess around with things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have a question here, which actually I think you did mention earlier, Nathaniel mentioned earlier when he was talking about the uh, coding and whatnot related to it. Uh, we have a question that says, we don't have, have Dynex. Will this Will all of this be feasible with other systems? That's a good question. So it really depends on your ILS, right? Mm -hmm. um, actually, it depends on both sides. It depends on what systems you're trying to integrate together. So in this case, um, our student information system, it's really easy to export what they call ad hoc reports into a CSV format. So basically, you get a spreadsheet of data, and then you can use that to convert to whatever format the other system understands. Um, so my, my answer to you is um, what I wrote in Python was very specific to our situation. And I mm -hmm. think that unless you um, are a Cersei Dynex library with the same setup as Scott County has, and that also your school district you're working with is an infinite campus school district, that it probably will not work for you, but the concepts are the same. And so um, I think that at that point, it's just important to find somebody in either organization that um, is familiar with those two systems and see how they can integrate. You might not need any code to make this work. Um, in our case, we did because of our limitations, but mm -hmm. depending on how your systems can talk to each other, um, it might be a lot easier. So this is like for people who are not doing, don't have Cersei Dynex, um, it's a proof of concept and take it to your, uh, whoever your tech people is in both places and say, here's what we want to do. How does it, how does our system, how can our system do it? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, I mean, most of the script is just like text manipulation, just moving one piece of text somewhere else. And so the other system can identify how to process that data. Um, but it, again, every system is going to be really different. So it's really a case by case basis. Sure. Sure. And she asked, could we use Excel? I mean, I suppose if that's what your system can work with. Yeah, and a lot of systems will. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say that um, to the question asker, um, I'm aware of a, actually it's St. Paul Public Library who has made this happen. I'm aware of some other school or some other school districts and public library systems who have used systems like um, Cersei Jennings's Horizon, have used um, Polaris's um, um, system or innovative or any of the other ILSs. So um, I'll, if you want to send me an email, I might be able to connect you to somebody um, who you can ask as well. I say mm -hmm. that's what librarians do. We try to find the answer for you. Sure, sure. Great. She says, sure, thanks. You'll probably hear from Jean. <laughs> um, I have a question here about the cards themselves. How are cards expired when a student leaves the district? Um, if they graduate, of course, or if they move? I can answer that. Um, so we have July 1st as our first 
um, expiration date. So it is based on in our system based on their graduation. So um, it is going to be something that I and the technical services staff um, run a report on to say, um, you know, any any account that's within our Shakopee Schools group with this particular field, which is their graduation year on July 1st, we're going to expire it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to bore people with the details, but I can also, um, if you want to email me separately, I can talk through what that looks like at our level as well. Sure. But yes, we do have an expiration mm -hmm. um, included, and then we'll probably purge the accounts afterwards as well. Right. And then if someone like in the middle of a year, though, moves or leaves the, the, that particular district, I suppose this would be something that would be everybody involved gets notified of that and it comes out when you're in, in some ways figured out. Yes. Like if they're not I graduating, think, but they just like moved out of the district or somewhere. Yes, I think we, that we're not, we just, we're not accounting for unenrollments right now. Um, that's something that we're looking to approve on later. At the moment, if a, if a student were to leave the district, you know, have it through the year, um, their account would remain active because we're not marking them. Uh, we're not the data we're sending to Scott County is not marked as unenrolled. It's just that they don't exist in the poll anymore in the data poll. Um, but Scott County will not remove their accounts because they don't exist in that data set, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I think okay. it's a manual cleanup process. Right. Um, I think our focus was more on making sure people have access rather than taking the access away. Sure. And then when you do that July expiration, that's when full cleanup can be done of anybody who has and removed. Yes. That's a, that's, a, that's our summer school rollover too. So we, mm -hmm. we will graduate students into the next grade on July 1 generally. So that's kind of our, our regular drop dead date for when we do cleanup as well. You're already doing it for other things, so now you just do it for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing I'll mention too is that um, we'll be sending some messaging out to graduating students, letting them know that their account is expiring and now they can apply for a standard issue card. Sure. I've seen I've heard of other places doing that when this when they've had this kind of joint thing with the public library. And then now you get to have just that card. Yay. Congratulations on graduating. <laughs> All right. All right, that was the last question. Have anybody else have any other questions? We did just hit 11 a.m. by my clock, which is our official um, end time of the show. But um, if anybody has any other, we did start a little after, so. Um, anybody have any other desperate questions you wanna ask of our speakers today? Uh, type it in the question section and we can do that. Um, I have to say, this is a great presentation. Glad I was able to get you guys on the show to talk about this today. Uh, even though I am not as a uh, as computer techie as you might be, Nathaniel, with all of this, <laughs> an IT person, I did understand what you were explaining. So, <laughs> hey, I think good I able to actually like talk to somebody about it in the basic terms, at least. <laughs> sure, and like I mentioned earlier, if you have any follow up questions for us, um, I just put this the slide back mm -hmm. up of um, our contact information so please feel free to reach out to us um, and we'll try and answer your questions to the best of our abilities mm -hmm. great i'm so glad that's great for you guys to be available to everybody all right i don't see, see unless somebody's typing doesn't look like there's any last minute desperate questions right now so i think we can um officially wrap it up for today uh thank you so much christy sandy and nathaniel for being with us uh this morning um, this was a session I didn't mention at the beginning, but um, all of them and myself, we were originally supposed to be um, presenting back in March at the Library Technology Conference up, um, in St. Paul, and uh, that was canceled due to COVID-19. Uh, but many of these presenters I'm having um, come on Encompass Live to at least get this, get the word out so that we can get some of these presentations shared with everybody. And hopefully we'll have some more of them. So thank you so much, um, all of you, for um, being here today with us. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Yes, thank right. you. I am, yeah, I'm gonna pull presenter control back to show my screen. Again, there we go. All right. So um, this is the um, session page for the show today. Um, as you can see here, I do we do have the presentation linked here as already, and this will be so it's on there right now. And it will be included when we do the archive recording page as well. So um, all those slides that you were just watching, all in addition with the contact information for everybody, will be is available right there for you afterwards. Um, 
and I'll go back to our main Encompass Live page. Here we go. So that will be for today's show. The recording will be available, should be real by the end of the week, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. And it will be, here's our upcoming shows, but here's where our archives are, right underneath there. Most recent show is at the top of the list, and this is the one we did last week, and it will just have the link, there'll be a link to the recording, and the link that's already there to the presentation will be included. Uh, everybody who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's ready. And we also push it out to our various social media out on Twitter uh, for Encompass Live. We also do have a Facebook page for it, so we will be posted there as well. So if you are a big Facebook user, do give us a like over there, and you'll get notifications of um, updates to things going on with Encompass Live. Here's a reminder that posted this morning to log in for today's show, um, when our new shows are coming up, when um, recordings are available. Um, so a couple times a week, you'll get notifications on Facebook if you um, would like to give us a like over there. And I'll mention what we're here in our archives. Uh, for a lot of people who are looking for professional development or just learning more about things, uh, you can watch any of our archives here. You can, there's a search feature here to search the entire sh um, show archive. And you see we do have an option here to search just the most recent 12 months. That is because this, this is the full archives of Encompass Live. We brought um, The show premiered in January 2009, so we do have 10 years worth of archives here. I'm not going to scroll all the way down and make you go dizzy with that, but um, if you want just recent info, limit to the most recent 12 months, but you can search the entire archive for any topic you want. Just pay attention to the date when it was originally broadcast. Uh, some some things some some sessions will you know stand the test of time, but some things may be old, expired. Um, information might be wrong or different now. Some services or products might not exist anymore or not exist in the in the way that they were originally presented. Um, but just do pay attention if you are watching any of our archives. Um, but we are librarians. We do archive things for historic historic purposes, so we will always have the full archives there. Just you know pay attention to when things were originally broadcast. So that will be for today's show. Hope you join us on our future shows. Here's our June dates are filled up here. I do have a couple of July dates that I'm just getting, getting on the calendar soon. I'm just finalizing some information, so keep an eye on our schedule for those. And um, I hope you join us next week when our topic is identity and imposter syndrome in library maker spaces. I feel for this. <laughs> In many ways, this is another session that was originally to be broadcast. It was supposed to be part of the uh, Library Technology Conference in Mark. Um, and Leanne will be with us to talk about um, how you can overcome that. So please do sign up for that show or any of our other future shows on Encompass Live. So thank you very much, everybody, for being here. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.